Good afternoon. My name is River Hustad, and I'm a uh, advisor at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights here in Oslo, Norway. Uh, I have a PhD in you know, human rights law at the University of Oslo. And uh, today I have the pleasure of talking to you about uh, the universalism of human rights. So I am going to now share a PowerPoint. So uh, as you can see from the title, that uh, this is going to be a, a bit of a legal approach to universalism of human rights. And as I'll explain, it's essential to look at this from a legal perspective, because otherwise there is really no universalism in human rights. So before I start, I'd just like to thank the organizers, uh, Professor Bagid, uh, for the invitation to speak. Today, I wish I could speak with you in uh, Indonesia. It, this is actually a, a subject that uh, is rather difficult to handle in just one lecture. I would really prefer to do this. I mean, it, it's, it could take an entire course of 10 lectures uh, on this subject, but uh, we'll, try, we'll see what we can do on uh, just one lecture. But this is an outline of what uh, we're going to do. I'm gonna start out talking a bit about human dignity, talk about uh, universalism of, of human rights, uh, whether it's possible, and then get into uh, universalism of law, and then structural standards and substantive standards and connect that to uh, how human rights, this universalism becomes localized. And as I said, this is a very complex topic. What Gary Teeple has said, this is uh, reported uh, to be one of the most debated absolute claims in human rights. One of the areas in human rights that uh, there's significant disagreement between scholars. And so what I'm going to present to you today is a compilation of a number of scholars, uh, a number of cases to, to analyze it, a number of examples to, to try to understand some of these uh, complex philosophical ideas and uh, and some authors are contradictory to one another and also I'll present different sides of it. And uh, yes, and as a, a matter of the context, I definitely don't want this to be me standing up in my academic tower telling you this is the way it is. Uh, it's very much an enlightenment based um, presentation that I'm going to give that I'm not preaching about human rights. I'm not telling you or trying to convince you about the uh, uh, efficacy of human rights. What I'm doing is presenting a significant amount of research from a number of scholars and uh, compiling that and, and presenting it so that you can make up your own mind uh, about what you think uh, human rights are and whether or not that they are universal. So it's an open question. Are human rights universal? And uh, of course, in, in this recorded lecture, we won't have the opportunity to ask questions, but uh, I'll be glad to speak with you after the lecture when we have the discussion part. And uh, you can certainly send me an email or something afterwards. You'll get a copy of my presentation. There's a number of references in the presentation, uh, book references, or like in this picture, you might see a little person down on the side with a quote and their name, and that's just to give you, uh, point you in the direction of certain authors uh, that you can, or different scholars that you can uh, do additional research and uh, see more about what I'm talking about that I may not have enough time to talk about it in this lecture. So to start out with, let's ask the question, is human rights universal? And you might notice grammatically, I'm saying is human rights universal, not are human rights universal, because we're talking about the concept of human rights, not specific human rights. Uh, if it was a number of specific human rights, plural human rights, then it would be are human rights universal. So I want to emphasize here that we're talking about the concept of human rights. So we're saying is human rights universal. One aspect that you hear whenever this universality comes up. Uh, 
you, one of the first things that you hear is, yes, human rights are universal because they, uh, they span, they cover all of, uh, all of the moral claims. So as these two authors have said, uh, Nadine Gordimer has said that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the essential document, the touchstone, the creed of humanity that surely sums up all other creeds directing human behavior. And Max Stackhouse similarly has said that human rights must be grounded in some sort of trans transcendent moral laws. And the other thing that you normally hear when we talk about universality, human dignity comes right in there very quickly. And uh, there's claims that, well, seeing that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights talks about, as you see in the bottom line down there, a spirit of brotherhood and practically every human rights treaty names in the preamble says that it's based on human dignity. And so there's an attempt to say, oh, so we'll see everyone because they're human beings, because they have this dignity, everyone has rights because of that. Well, what have some authors said? Well, Elie Wiesel has, has criticized human rights as uh, that this sort of understanding of human rights is to make human rights into what he calls a worldwide secular religion. And Michael Ignatieff, he writes in his uh, book, Human Rights as Politics and Idolatry, he says that natural human dignity lends to an, uh, an idolatry of human rights, a metaphor of worship that is cult-like. So there's, it makes it into an acceptance, we, we start to try to convince others that human rights is, is almost like a, some other religion. And so he, he goes on to say that elevating the moral and metaphysical claims made on behalf of human rights may be intended to increase its universal appeal. In fact, it has the opposite effect, raising doubts among religious and non-Western groups who do not happen to be in need of Western secular creeds. What he's saying here is that if I'm trying to tell you, if I'm trying to convince you today that human rights are universal because it's, it's some sort of universal moral system, if others have other moral systems, how is that moral system going to compete? Then you just have two competing moral systems. Uh, what Ignatieff says is that human rights is an idea without an idea. That is, it's an idea, an idea of human rights that is not based on any particular moral creed or, or religious type of, uh, of basis. So if, well, let's just lead to the question that I have here. Is, human, is universal human rights even possible? If we think about all the different worldviews, and uh, is there any sort of common denominator for them? Is there any sort of overlap? And this is, try to conceptualize that. Uh, if each of these circles is a different worldview, there's, there is no point that we can say, ah, here's an overlap where all the circles have at least something in common. That's, it just doesn't exist. As Jacques Martian said, he sent in a submission when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being written. He sent in a submission to, with this observation. He asked, how can we imagine an agreement of minds between men who come from the four corners of the globe and who not only belong to different cultures and civilizations, but are of antagonistic spiritual associations and schools of thought. So what, how can we say that human rights is universal if there's no overlapping common standard that it's based on? Also, how can we say that uni human rights is universal if we see continued violations or con continued deprivations uh, of rights throughout the world? And these are just three examples of the many thousands of human rights uh, deprivations that we see in the world. Uh, 
and what Jeremy Waldron has said, that the idea that there might be such things as human rights valid for all people in all times and places has often seemed implausible in the face of wide variety of what we would call oppressive and inhuman practices that are taken for granted, even expected in different parts of the world. So if we expect these deprivations in the world, how can, we, and, and we also don't have any uh, moral, uh, common moral claim, and we have no uh, common uh, following of this principle of human rights or whatever this human rights is, then how can we say that it's universal? It has no universal basis, it has no universal following, so how can it be universal? Before we I try to answer that question, let's try to understand the question a little bit more. If in the moral world, if, if we were to look at human rights as some sort of moral claim, what and a moral claim in competition with other moral claims, how do we resolve moral conflict? Moral conflict is unresolvable. And as an example of this, if we go back 500 years in time, there was a, a moral debate that happened as Spain was expanding into what they called the New World in Latin America. And they wanted to know what they should do with the individuals who live there. And so the king, Charles V, he actually called a very formal debate. He wanted to, to decide what to do. And so on one side, Juan Sepulveda, he said that these individuals, he was making the moral claim that these individuals in the new world, they were barbarians and therefore they were natural slaves. On the other hand, Bartolome de las Casas, he said that no, these are individuals with dignity, and they have equality. And he also said that, well, then we should uh, convert them to Christianity in that case. But he was making the claim that these individuals had dignity and deserved equality. And so the two sides made their claims, their moral claims, and what happened afterwards. They both said that they won. They both highly publicized that they won. And there was no change in policy from the king because there was no way to resolve the moral conflict. Moral conflicts are just two presentations of two opposing viewpoints, and there's no way to resolve that conflict. There's no structure to, revolve, to resolve that conflict. Another fundamental uh, issue to, to deal with is that not only is there unresolved moral conflict, but there's this unresolved material conflict. And to go back in time even farther, to even further to 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, there was the uh, Athenians, and uh, they were attacking a neutral island of Melos. And the island of Melos, they make a claim, we are just men fighting against unjust and invoke what is fair and right. They claim this moral statement. And the Athenians, they completely reject that moral statement. They don't even want to argue the other side of the moral statement. They say, you have mentioned nothing which men might trust in and think to be saved by. The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. So uh, whether or not you have uh, moral claims, or you, you just reject moral claims, and you, you just have the exercise of power, is human rights, is a universal human rights possible in the reality of this world. And just to bring that forward in time so it's not so distant, in World War II, in the opening of World War II, Norway faced the same situation. And Germany said, no, nothing can save you. So it's not so far away, less than 100 years ago, same situation. So how can we say that, that human rights are universal when these when moral claims cannot be universal, and that moral claims are often just rejected in the exercise of power. That brings me to Marie Benedicta Demboid. She says that there are four schools of human rights thought, 
And so when we talk about the universality of human rights, the question really is, what type of human rights are we talking about? If we're talking about philosophy and ideas, about the moral claims, that's one thing. If we're talking about uh, the politics, the rhetoric, the exercise of power, that's a different type of human rights and connected to, to revolution and the opposition to power. If we look at human rights as law, then we find universality there. And what does it mean to say that human rights, we'll, we'll look at human rights as law? Well, in law, there's something called the separation thesis. Uh, the positivists, positivist lawyers will say that law is distinct, it's separate from philosophy, from politics, from revolution. It's, uh, a divider has been made, and instead of trying to uh, determine claims or or what is universal in this chaos of the world, law creates something that is, has some sort of order, order out of chaos. And then, uh, as Aristotle said, then we can be servants to the law in, in, in its limited capacity, in its more structured capacity. And so John Austin, he was the, considered the father of positivism. And he emphasized that what the law is, is one thing, and what the law ought to be is a different thing. So what the law is, there we might be able to answer and say, okay, this, universal, uh, this universalism in law uh, within the legal system, outside of the legal system, it's just nothing. We can't, it's chaos. And if you're familiar with Game of Thrones, Tyrion Lannister reminded us of the same thing. Don't confuse what is within the law with what ought to be. Now, I know that this sounds a bit, uh, or, or probably sounds very legalistic. You're probably wondering, what does all this law have to do with whether or not human rights is universal? And if you bear with me, I'll come to that as quickly as I can. But we need a bit of background to understand where we're coming from. What does this mean? So uh, the human rights regime said to start in 1945. And it's that point that I'll uh, make the assertion that universalism of human rights first began. It got its roots started. And what Michael Ignatieff has said that there was a juridical revolution uh, in 1945. It started a little bit before that with the League of Nations, with the International uh, Labor Organization. But we'll say in 1945, this thing that we'll call the human rights regime starts. And what is this, this human rights regime? Well, it's a selected common standard. So in this world of chaos, of many overlapping worldviews, certain things are chosen out. There is a selection is made and certain things are brought into law. And so it starts in 1945 with the charter and then a number of uh, human rights treaties and covenants, conventions are signed, and I seem to be missing CEDAW, the Women's Convention here, but uh, a number of treaties are created, and those treaties then create something. They create this regime that we can call a common standard. And what is this legal creation? Well, it's a tool what Osbjorn Ida has said, it's a structural approach. It's not, uh, some might say it's a utopian aspiration of human rights, but no, it's structure. Human rights law is a tool to go from some sort of ideas to the enjoyment of the, those ideas. And law is a tool to get there. It's a universally agreed to tool. And what is the universal agreement of? It's an agreement of process. What Hart has said, uh, one of the uh, foundational figures of positivism, of legal positivism, he said that law is reference to an authoritative text or to an official whose declarations on this point are authoritative. And Joseph Raz talks about the legal paradigm of procedure. So what is being agreed to? It's a process, a process for resolving social conflict. 
that process is a road. If you're familiar with this movie, The Wizard of Oz, it's the yellow brick road from the idea of human rights along this road is a, a tool to reach the enjoyment of human rights. And this brings me to the title of this presentation, The Law is a Matrix. And what do I mean by a matrix? If you're not familiar with the movie, it's, uh, it's an artificially constructed reality. And if you're not familiar with the movie, it's also uh, Rene Descartes has a very similar concept uh, that he used. And uh, it's something that's used in philosophy. It's called the brain in a vat uh, thought experiment. But in a matrix, when I say that uh, law is a self-contained system or a matrix, what I'm saying here is this human rights regime has created something, has artificially created an artificial reality in a sense. And within that artificial reality, we can find universalism internally within that artificial reality. What Jeffrey Hazard says is a law is a non-utopian social construction for controlling social conflict. So it's not a utopia, it's just a social construct. And within that construct, we can find universalism. And what do I mean by this, this matrix, this universalism? If we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the preamble, it says that the declaration is a common standard of achievement. And that's just what it is. It's an agreement, it's a universal agreement of all the countries that, okay, this is what we're going to aim for. What Kofi Annan has said is the yardstick by which we measure human progress. So prior to this yardstick, nobody knew how to measure or everyone had their own different ways of measuring things. And the human rights system, the human rights regime, this artificial matrix creates a yardstick and universalizes the form of measurement. So with this now universalized form of measurement, then we can see that, well, if everyone's using the same measurement, then we can have some sort of universality. As uh, again, referring to Ignatieff, he points out that in the Universal Declaration that the, uh, the lack of a God uh, in the UDHR is a sign of pragmatic common denominator designed to make agreement possible across a range of divergent cultural and political viewpoints. So by not having any sort of religious reference or natural law reference in the Universal Declaration, like are found in other constitutions, like the, the US Declaration of Independence, uh, without that, and, and just focusing on, okay, what is, let's form a common standard of achievement, a yardstick, then it uh, enables it to be universal. It doesn't tie it down to any one normative system. And just to emphasize this point, this separation of law and, and other things, and, and what is this legal matrix, this constructed reality that we can find universalism inside of. Just to drive it home a little bit more, if we look in, uh, according to Hart's theory of the moral world versus the legal world, he says that individuals have their, their different actions and their habits. And when a number of people in a society, when their habits start to converge, then they're, they're just doing the same thing and uh, then we have a social habit. And once they are doing the same thing and they're doing it because they believe it's the right thing to do, then it becomes a, a social rule or a social norm. But that is all separate from law. On the other side of this wall in the legal world, this constructed reality, this matrix, that's where we can have universality. Over there in the moral world, it's impossible. There's just too many different people, too many different habits, too many different norms. Impossible to have universality. In the legal world, a yardstick has been created. A universal system of measurement has been created. 
there we can find universalism. As Ignatieff has said again, human rights is an account of what is rights, not what is good. So it's about what the, the, the human rights regime has created, what the trees have created, what rights have they created, what system have they created, not about what is good. When we talk about this human rights regime, uh, I could answer the, the question about universality very quickly. And with this one slide, tell you, yep, that, that's why uh, there's universalism and, and the presentation. Because within this constructed matrix, this artificial reality, if we look, the rules of that reality say very clearly that human rights are universal. Almost all states, so you can see on the map there in the upper left that the um, Western Sahara seems to be the only significant area that is not a member of the United Nations. Complex issue there, but uh, basically the entire world are state parties to the UN Charter. Basically the entire world has human rights treaty obligations to at least five of the treaties. Uh, seems, yes, I don't see any countries that are less than five Western Sahara again, but yeah. Uh, so the charter applies, is law, it's the standard, the accepted yardstick of all the countries. Uh, the human rights treaties, also part of the uh, accepted yardstick. And then in 1993, the Vienna, Vienna Declaration on Human Rights, 171 states agree that, quote, all human rights are universal. Well, ergo, they must be universal because this international system, uh, these two authors here remind us that uh, in international law, uh, the legitimacy and efficacy comes from national consent and seeing countries have consented to become members of the charter, have consented to become members of the treaty and consented to the Declaration of Human Rights that says that all human rights are universal, well, they must be universal. So human rights are universal because the law says that it's universal. That's not a, a satisfactory answer though. We need to dig a little deeper to have a better understanding of what actually is going on there. Well, beyond a simple declaration by law that human rights are, in, are universal, human rights are also used. They're, <clears throat> they're the dominant discourse. Uh, Louis Hankin has said that it's the idea of our time, and Professor Beletsky has said that, yes, that this human rights are the lingua franca of global political politics. So when issues are being discussed, they're being discussed in the framework of human rights. So that gives, starts to give us a hint of where we're heading uh, as far as where, what is universality in this constructed matrix. Now, I've talked a lot about law and that emphasizing that universality exists within law and exists only within law. You might become a little concerned that, oh, uh, maybe the fate of human rights is in the hands of lawyers. And that's probably not a very good thing. Lawyers aren't always the most uh, trustful uh, individuals. And uh, so, it, but it, it's not just lawyers, and I'll explain this uh, as we go along, but it's certainly not lawyers. It's not certainly not limited to lawyers, although it is a legal system. It's a legal system de uh, uh, designed so that everyone is, can participate. There is universal participation, and I'll explain that as we uh, continue. So uh, I'm going to look at this in two different ways. There are two, remember uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that there is a common standard of achievement. So there are two types of common standards of achievement. One is the substantive standards, all of the individual human rights uh, in, the, in the lists of the different covenants, in the lists of the declaration. Then we see substantive standards, the freedom of religion and belief is one substantive standard. The freedom of expression, another substantive standard. 
in addition to the substantive standards, there are structural standards. This human rights matrix, this regime, this created real legal reality creates a structure. And I'm going to deal first with the structure and then with the substantive standards because the structural standards illuminate the, what the substantive standards mean and how we deal with them. So to start with, the, here we see the, all the different states. The states get together. They, in what's called the horizontal relationship, they have created this legal regime. They have created this matrix. And what they have created is a relationship between the state and the individual, a recognized relationship between the state and, and the individual where there are these substantive standards. Uh, the state is a duty bearer, the individual is a rights holder, the individual can claim these substantive standards, but it's also a structural standard because the individual has the ability to claim, to, to put forward the claim to the state of what uh, substantive standards should be fulfilled. This is called a vertical relationship between the state and the individual. Something that I like to call the diagonal relationship is the, the focus for the next few, 10 or 15 minutes. And it's the structural standards that states and, and states in, uh, who are members of multilateral organizations and in the international fora, they have the ability to examine the state individual relationship and to determine whether or not uh, it is functioning properly, whether or not the state is fulfilling its substantive standards. And it's not just the states that are able to do that, the states and their organizations, but it's also individuals and their NGOs and treaty bodies and other mechanisms. So all of these mechanisms in the system that's created in this human rights matrix creates a universal, structure with universal participation from all sides to examine the uh, state and individual relationship, this vertical relationship. So everybody's looking at the, this relationship armed with their binoculars. Thomas Hobbes would say that the a covenant without swords are just words. So he wouldn't think that uh, binoculars would be a very good way to uh, enforce uh, treaty obligations or en enforce any obligations. He would say that everybody needs a sword, but uh, we have a different system today. Everyone is armed with uh, virtual binoculars to be able to examine this relationship. And I'll explain what that means and with a number of examples. Before I do that though, when we're talking about this human rights regime, this artificial created matrix, and that, that there's an ability to examine this vertical relationship, there's a little hiccup to that that we need to look at. Within the human rights matrix, within the regime, there is something called state sovereignty, that states have what's called sovereign equality between states, and as we see in the UN Charter, Article 2.7, it says that nothing contained in the present charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. Many states, even today, attempt to say, well, see, there's a, a border around my, uh, there's a wall around the borders of my state, and nobody can be looking into my state. Keep your binoculars out and uh, you have no right to examine what's going on in that vertical relationship. But that is not the case. Article 2.7 doesn't mean that. That what is, what it says here, what is essentially within the domestic jurisdiction, well, there are, that vertical relationship is no longer in the domestic jurisdiction. In 1947, there was something that was called the No Power 
doctrine. And that was where the UN being very careful as it was first starting, didn't want to antagonize the states. They were already had the experience of the League of Nations where uh, many countries didn't, didn't join, particularly the United States. And so the UN didn't want to antagonize the states. So they just had a hands off uh, approach to start with and weren't getting involved and saying, okay, domestic jurisdiction means you know, we're not going to look at the human rights situations. Slowly over time, as it started to look at apartheid, it started to create different procedures for examining things. And then the regional, uh, the regional human rights developments of the Helsinki Final Act and the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe, they further eroded this idea that uh, domestic jurisdiction means no examination of the, the vertical relationship. And so, uh, we come forward to 1993, again, the Vienna Declaration on Human Rights, paragraph four, the 171 states, all states at that time, said that the promotion and protection of all human rights is a legitimate concern of the international community. So if there was any question prior to that, after 1993, then these, this human rights legal matrix opened up and created a universal structure, a universal structure by which everyone can participate in determining whether or not this, the universal standards are being met. Just as an example of this universal structure and, and that state sovereignty is, does not interfere with this ability to examine the vertical structure. In 1984, the, there was an election in apartheid South Africa, and not only was there an election, but the adoption of a new constitution. And the Security Council actually determined, you know, looking into the internal affairs of a state and said that election and the adoption of that constitution are null and void. What, what more intrusion into a state and criticism inside the domestic, what would be normally considered the domestic policy of the state. Uh, how much more intrusion can you have? And uh, it doesn't mean that states don't attempt to continue to use this as, a, as an argument point, as an excuse why there shouldn't be criticism. In 2011, uh, the US Secretary of State, she expressed serious concerns that the election in Russia was not free and fair. And the response from Russia was, that's none of their business. Well, it is their business. It's everyone's business. Based on this human rights regime, this legal matrix that has been created, we're all living in the matrix. We're all living in this human rights regime. And within that regime, there is a universal structure, the universal examination of everyone has the ability to examine that vertical relationship between the state and the individual. So uh, Professor uh, Zhao Rongli, she has said that universalism is based on a reasonable, non-relativistic public conversation. And that's what we're talking about here. This universal structure is a public conversation. And the universal structure, there's rules of uh, the conversation, there's rules of the structure, and the rules of the structure are the examination of that vertical relationship. Robert Unger, a legal philosopher, he reminds us too that lawmaking involves many conflicts of interests and vision fought out by countless minds and wills working uh, at cross purposes. And so in this, this, within this legal matrix, within this human rights regime, this universal structure that is created enables all of this interaction uh, going on to determine what is the law in any particular case. Charles Taylor, even more specifically, he says that universalism is a universal structure rules of conduct, conduct, striving toward universal beliefs in a fusion of horizons. 
So it's a universal structure that is helping us to reach the universal substance. So this is why I wanted to start with the structure because it helps explain where we get substance and what substance is and uh, how we determine substance. So the universal structure is uh, the ability, it's the fundamental aspect of how we get universalism in human rights. It's, it's the basis of reaching the uh, universal uh, substantive standards. And again, Professor Beletsky, she says that universalism, uh, a universalism that is no more but no less than a functional civilized consensus on human rights. So that's what we're, that's what the, uh, the substance is trying to do is, or that's how we achieve the substance is through consensus in this universal structure. So we need the universal structure in order to have the universal substance. And I'll, I'll just take a moment now to talk a little bit about what this structure is and how it's designed and how it's designed to be universal. So uh, there's a legal space with international mechanisms. I said it's not just lawyers, but there is a legal space with, for example, the International Court of Justice, the quasi-legal treaty bodies, the regional courts, very formalistic legal operation. There are, of course, uh, national legal mechanisms, all the court systems in the various countries, the constitutions, all uh, contributing to what human rights are, all examining the vertical relationships in states. Of course, national mechanisms mostly within their own state. There's also a political space internationally in all the UN organs, the individual civil servants within the United Nations, specialized agencies of the, of the states, like the, for example, the World Health Organization and the World Bank, and then conglomerations of, of states and powerful actors uh, in multilateral organizations, in the World Economic Forum, uh, the OSCE, just some examples. And then, of course, there's the political space domestically within countries. And I've put some pictures up here of some arguments going on in various parliaments. And the reason I put that in is just to remind us that, well, I said that law was a way to resolve social conflict. It doesn't mean that social conflict doesn't, doesn't no longer exists. There's still a significant amount of conflict that goes on. But it, the law creates a structure, a system by which that conflict can be discussed and eventually voted on and resolved. In the 1550 debate about the, the new world, the two sides just presented their opinions. There was no way to resolve the social conflict. With the structure that we have, parliaments, courts, there's ways to resolve the social contract. A vote is eventually taken. And often people are not very satisfied with it and some fighting can break out, but uh, that is the nature of humanity, I suppose. Key to this universal structure are NGOs, other conglomerations of individuals, and of course, individuals on, on their own. There's room for them, there's democratic space for them in this universal structure to participate because it is universal. Let's just take a bit even closer look at a few of these aspects of a universal structure. So in the treaty bodies, for example, the treaty bodies have each human rights treaty has an administrative body attached to it, a committee. Uh, they're often called quasi courts. They look, they act a little bit like courts. They look like courts. And uh, so these treaty bodies, they all have something called uh, periodic reports where a state will prepare a report, send it to the treaty body, the treaty body will examine it and issue some concluding observations. The process toward that, Part of this legal matrix is the creation of a functional universal structure, a universal structure that enables us to arrive at a universal substance. 
So just as an example with the concluding observations, so, well, first of all, the Human Rights Committee attached to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, they have said that these concluding observations are constructive and sincere dialogue. What does that mean? Well, from the very start, when a state is first starting to prepare their periodic report, they're going to do a self-evaluation. They're going to uh, do some internal contemplation and then start consulting with civil society. Uh, and in that consulting process, in that reflective process, then there can be an analysis of, well, what are human rights? Is the state fulfilling its vertical obligations? And civil society can also contribute to that. So it, it creates a universal structure. There is a created universal structure by which these issues can be discussed toward, so that they can work toward consensus. And then after the report is created, uh, not only does the state submit a report, but also all of civil society organizations and individuals, they can also submit shadow reports. There's an example of a, there of a shadow report from Sudan. Once they're submitted to the committee, the committee has what's called a constructive discussion with the state and then issues its concluding observations. And then all of this, all of this documentation, all of these reports, all of the discussion that's go, gone on, all of the concluding observations, those all become, those are all public documents that civil society and other actors in this universal structure are able to grab a hold of and uh, hold states to any promises that they've made or uh, criticized based on any analysis that's been made that shows where there's been shortcomings of the state. It, it, it creates a means of working toward consensus, a means of discourse. That is what the universal structure is. Even within the treaty bodies, there's an internal discourse that's going on. So Manfred Nowak, he wrote the commentary on the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. He has said that, that there's extreme pressure toward consensus on their general comments. The, the treaty bodies can issue general comments, which are uh, basically restatements of what they believe the state of the substantive obligations, the substantive standards are. And uh, there's discussion within the committee and they come to a consensus. These treaty bodies can also accept individual cases. There's, there's an additional process by which a state consents to that. But uh, when, the, when a treaty body examines an individual case, it, it issues a view, uh, an analysis, and a determination of whether or not an individual has had their rights violated in this vertical relationship. And there's also continued internal discourse within the uh, treaty body because each individual member of the the committee are able to file their own opinions whether it's a dissenting opinion or a concurring opinion and then all of this all of these documents all of this discourse then enters the lexicon of the entire system so that the this universal structure is not only made up of various entities individuals and mechanisms and collective bodies, but it also is made up of a process by which the discourse is facilitated. I just wanted to show an example of how this discourse works its way through, how it can have an effect. This was a case in Norway. Uh, there was a neo-Nazi organization and uh, they had a march and someone gave a speech uh, the speech was very threatening to Jews and a case was brought uh, on to the went all the way to the Norwegian Supreme Court the Norwegian Supreme Court said that the speech was offensive but there were no actual threats of violence or instructions to others to commit violence there was enormous amount of debate in civil society in the newspapers about this issue and whether or not it had crossed the line whether or not it was it was uh, encouraging people to attack uh, minorities. 
uh, there was actually there was actually an attack on a minority, and a, a young black youth was killed by neo Nazis, one of which had been at that march. Uh, so when it came, uh, the case eventually made its way past the Supreme Court in, in Norway and went to the Human Rights Committee. And the Human Rights Committee said, uh, the Human Rights Committee said that the speech was incitement at least to racial discrimination, if not to violence. It is not protected by the freedom of speech. It went back to Norway and Norway then amended the criminal statute and the Minister of Justice said that they would uh, enforce the new statute and in compliance with what the Human Rights Committee uh, had stated. And a, st a similar case with another neo-Nazi came up, Tiger Tvet, and he was found guilty for a very similar speech. And so this, this case, I, I just wanted to show how this, this dialogue through all of these mechanisms where everyone is able to contribute in this universal structure toward arriving at universal substance. In addition to treaty bodies, uh, there are also special procedures. These are special rapporteurs uh, that are appointed by the Human Rights Committee, one of which, Manfred Nowak, he said, uh, emphasized that the role of the special rapporteur is a process of sustained constructive cooperation, discourse, dialogue with states, all part of this universal structure to create discourse which helps to arrive at universal substance. The special procedures are also, uh, also create uh, guidelines and those guidelines can then help states understand and, and reach a consensus about what the uh, universal substance is. This just gives an example of how the special procedures can work through this discourse that can create this discourse in within the universal structure to arrive at some consensus about uh, the universal substance. This was a case in Nigeria the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions uh, wrote in his report that characterizing adultery and sodomy as capital offenses leading to death by stoning is contrary to applicable Nigerian and international law. Neither can be considered to be one of the most serious crimes for which the death penalty may be prescribed, he continued. The response from Nigeria was that the notions that executions for offenses such as homosexuality and lesbianism are excessive is judgmental rather than objective. What may be seen by some as disproportional penalty in such serious offenses and odious conduct, such may be seen by others as appropriate and just punishment. So the argument from Nigeria is that, well, these are just uh, relative, uh, uh, relative views on uh, what is a serious crime, and so uh, there is there's no ability for you know, other entities can examine this vertical relationship, but they can't uh, supplant their view about what is appropriate and what is not. But then the response from the special rapporteur is that the suggestion that there are some who would consider the death penalty to be an appropriate and just punishment is, of course, entirely inconsistent with the federal law of Nigeria. The federal government has never taken this position, and my request to the government is simply that it reaffirms its legal obligations and acts in such a way as to ensure conformity on the part of the states. And so this, this universal structure of the special procedures has enabled a discourse and a public discourse to be made that lays bare that the response from Nigeria was had no legal basis, had no basis within the, this legal matrix, this created human rights regime, because it was Nigeria's own law that said that these were not serious crimes. So the position that Nigeria was trying to put forward was in violation of its own law. So it was in violation of the uh, human rights matrix right down to its own uh, 
domestic law. And, and then what happens is civil society can pick up on this and can use the claims of the state and the response from the special rapporteur to both help the state understand that, well, it's the state's own law that says that this is not appropriate. It's no one judging from, uh, from an external perspective. It's the state's own law that is doing this and we're gonna want to enforce that particular law. Another aspect of this universal structure of the High Commissioner for Human Rights who acts with uh, dialogue and gives recommendations, not just another part of this uh, enormous discourse going on. Uh, another example in the UN, the different organs of the UN, the Security Council and the General Assembly are seen to be as a, a courtroom of world opinion and a, a norm engine creating uh, world public opinion. And uh, of course, there's also a lot of politics in these bodies. And, and just some lighthearted examples. Nikita Khrushchev famously banging his shoe on the table, which an interesting aside is that the person who took that photograph, he said that after he took the photograph, he looked under the table and he saw that Khrushchev still had both of his shoes on. So either he had prepared and planned on uh, banging his shoe on the table in a very political display uh, and brought an extra shoe with him or he borrowed one from a subordinate. And uh, of course, Hugo Chavez from Venezuela famously compared President uh, Bush from the United States to the devil, uh, saying that he had been right here and it still smells of sulfur today. These, these organs, they contribute to this universal discourse that's going on. They're part of the universal structure of discourse toward the universal substance. It may get sidetracked every once in a while, but even that is better than nothing. Because as Winston Churchill said, it's better to jaw jaw than to war war. So even the process of participating in this process is achieving an end in itself. Uh, which, which then brings us to the Human Rights Council in particular. And uh, like I said before, we, we could look at this and say, ah, oh, the Human Rights Council has told us that, uh, the, that human rights are universal and the importance of ensuring their universality and the principle of universality and to promote universality, oh, they, human rights must be universal. But uh, beyond that simple surface explanation, what is, how is that implemented in the uh, human rights, uh, uh, should actually say human rights council, not human rights committee. With the, with the universal periodic review, a periodic review that the Human Rights Council does of every state and the human rights situation in every state. They again use cooperative mechanisms, interactive dialogue, build capacity of the state to understand its substantive obligations and to fulfill those substantive obligations in the vertical relationship. So again, it's this universal structure that is creating this universal discourse and it's that is how we arrive at universal substance. So returning to uh, Ignatyov's book again, he says that the fundamental moral commitment entailed by human rights is to this deliberation. It's the creation of this universal structure and that universal structure requires deliberation. And with the idea of rights goes a commitment to submit disputes to adjudication. So Yes, this discourse goes on, but eventually there are bodies, there are mechanisms that decide. There is the UN mechanisms, there's the national mechanisms, there's the UN treaty bodies that examine the national mechanisms. So uh, eventually a decision is able to be made and a resolution to the social conflict uh, is able to, to be arrived at. And he also emphasizes the importance of including in this universal system, the NGOs and the individuals, where he says that the enforcement of human rights has come principally from individuals and other non-state actors. They have constructed a genuinely global human rights culture. So he contributes 
much of the effectiveness of this universality to NGOs and individuals. And although this isn't really a part of the internal human rights matrix, the internal human rights regime, it's interesting that these uh, scholars have pointed out that the legitimacy of human rights comes from its procedural inclusiveness and transnational collaboration, and that the moral authority of collective judgments depends in part on the moral quality of the process by which those judgments are reached. So while uh, the existence of a legal matrix does not in any way require any sort of additional legitimacy, it's interesting that these authors observe that this participatory discourse and this universal participation of this universal structure actually builds moral legitimacy, even from an external perspective. I'm going to pause there and uh, we'll continue in a moment on uh, the substance, getting into the substance. I'll, I'll round off a little bit with the structure and lead into how the structure determines what the substance is, what is important in the substance. Just have to stop the recording here.